What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So we're gonna check out why Shawn Michaels was the 90s most hated man in wrestling, man. Uh, we all know the stories of how Sean was before uh, he found God, before he changed his ways or whatnot. We know Sean, uh, the stories of how he was pretty much, he was, he was difficult to deal with back in the, uh, in the early nineties or whatnot. Cause he knew he was the guy at that time. He knew he was one of the main attractions and, uh, he had a, a lot of pull backstage, but he also had a lot of controversy and beefs and issues. So we're going to check out why he was the most hated in the nineties, man. This should be an interesting one. Uh, this is by stunned by uh, wrestling. I'm subscribed to him. So make sure you guys go check him out. Appreciate all love and support, man. Let's get right into this one, man. Y'all go subscribe to him, man. Fucking Sean. Shawn Michaels was such an incredible performer. Nobody had provided WWE fans with so much entertainment in so many ways. A devastating back injury in 1998 seemingly cut Michael's career short. It was everyone's belief that Michael's time in the ring was over mm -hmm. and the fans thanked him for his service. Nobody ever expected Michael's to come back and yet he did. When Michael's returned four years later, he was like a brand new man. Yeah. Incredibly, Michael's would go on to provide almost another decade of career defining moments including wrestlemania matches and moments that will be remembered forever facts facts facts. however michael's peers in the locker room have provided a different perspective on the man over the years by all accounts michael's was like the devil behind <laughs> the scenes during his first run in the 90s causing trouble for everyone around him in this video we will take a closer look at why Shawn Michaels was one of the 90s most hated men in wrestling. This this uh, definitely sounds about right with many people's accounts and testimonies. Alright man, you may have to check out some more wrestling's most hated man, this sounds like After a pretty cool series. After his wrestling debut, Shawn Michaels was quickly paired with Marty Jannetty mm -hmm. as the Midnight Rockers in 1985. <laughs> the team absolutely thrilled at the that. AWA <laughs> Look at them. fans, providing them with in-ring action, the Damn. likes of which they'd never seen before. The tag team synchronicity that the Midnight Rockers displayed in their AWA matches was revolutionary and they set the pace for many of the tag teams that followed them in the years to come. The boys weren't just a team on screen, they would ride together and bunk together, always talking about the business and how they could continue to innovate Sean, during man, their matches. Crazy. Reports were abound that the Midnight Rockers really did rock all night long and in the words of Vergonia became tough to handle as their newfound fame quickly went to their heads. By day Michaels was thrilling in the ring and had an incredible mind for the business but by night he became a party animal. Alongside mm. Ginetti he was out all night hunting for women and often getting kicked out of bars and totally trashing hotel rooms. Michaels first visited Las Vegas in 1986. Uh -oh. His cocaine habit also started Whoa, that night boy. in a moment that he would later describe as the start of his downfall. It would be an addiction spanning over a decade. Whew. In an interview, Marty Ginetti estimated that he and Michaels were on the road for 300 days a year and they parted for 290 of those days. Pat Patterson scouted the Rockers for WWE in 1987. Their reputation was well ahead of them and according to Michaels, they were treated accordingly by the boys already in the Federation's locker room. We came into a pretty cold reception. People had heard about us. They thought we were young punks. All of it was true. 
For the first few weeks, Michaels and Ginetti tried to keep a low profile backstage, but once they were comfortable, they joined Davey Boy Smith and Jim Powers in the bar after a show. Late into the evening, mm. Jimmy Jack Funk appeared and started literally chewing glass and getting in the boys' faces. What? Eventually, Michaels broke a bottle over his own head to try and shut Funk up. It later transpired that Ginetti had been hitting on a girl in the bar that Powers was Oh, they were going in. wild! Powers later claimed that Michaels and Ginetti ended up tearing the bar up and caused a huge ruckus. Whether that was true or not, it was enough for Vince McMahon to backtrack on his decision to hire the Rockers in the first place. Damn. It was a devastating moment for both men, having so briefly reached the top of the mountain, they ended up getting fired and going back down to the bottom. This time, wrestling in front of just 50 people for the Continental Territory in Knoxville, Tennessee, Damn. for next to no money. Michael says that losing his job with WWE was devastating to him and he immediately entered a downward spiral of drug taking and suicidal thoughts. Damn. He said that the only thing stopping him from taking his life was the devastation that it would have caused his parents. After the experience of being at the top of the mountain employed by Vince McMahon, Ron Fuller's Continental Wrestling promotion was like being in the gutter. Each booking provided the boys with no more than $300, and Ginetti claimed that often they would accept payments in cocaine to top up their fee. Eventually, new Continental what? booker Bob Armstrong reached the end of his rope with Michaels and Ginetti and gave them their two weeks' notice. The boys decided to quit right away and walked out the door, leaving Armstrong with a hole in his booking sheet. Luckily for the Rockers, they still had some name value, and so were invited into the Memphis Wrestling Territory, who had connections back with the AWA. Things Look at started those titles. looking up for Michaels and Ginetti <laughs> once again, as they started to pick their game back up in the ring. Michaels could see that the writing was on the wall for the AWA as the industry was rapidly changing and they needed to get back to WWE. Vince McMahon was feeling generous in 1988 and gave Michaels and Ginetti a second chance, but they were told that this was their final opportunity. In the ring, the Rockers got back to their highly motivated best and the fans immediately took to the young babyface tag team. The Rockers never Look quite reached fits, the top man. of the tag team mountain, however, and truth be told, Ginetti was starting to irritate Michaels. Most of the fans at the time didn't realise that tensions had been brewing between the men for months. That bad sentiment came to a head one night in a hotel lobby. Blood was spilled very publicly. Exactly how the fight started between Michaels and Ginetti is still a mystery. However, the fight was brutal enough for the police to be called Ew. and for both the men I to didn't be know they had to it. Luckily, Randy Savage arrived at the hotel just in time to vouch for the pair and to sign some autographs for the cops. Otherwise, it would have been a night in the cells for both men. On screen, the fans were shocked and disgusted by Michaels as he threw Ginetti through the barbershop yeah, window classic and turned moment. heel. Michaels was adamant that he wanted to be a single superstar and to not have to share the spotlight with anybody else. In hindsight, classic we can moment. see the beginnings of these negative traits in Michaels that would be evident all the way through his career in the 90s. He was a wrestler who was as selfish and arrogant as he was gifted, mm -hmm. a drug addict who still managed to deliver gold every time he laced up his boots night after night. While Michaels was rid of Ginetti, he still recognised the importance of having someone's back, and more importantly, having somebody to watch his back in a business that was notoriously volatile. Mm -hmm. Damn, that was crazy. The Click were a notorious backstage faction formed of Michaels, Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, Recipe Sean Scott Walkman, Hall. and Paul Levesque, a.k.a. Triple H. Michaels was glad when Hall was hired to play the part of Razor Ramon, as they'd both been buddies while working in the AWA. Kevin Nash walked through the door next on the recommendation of Michaels to play his on-screen bodyguard. Hall and Nash had been friends since their days as lower mid-carders in WCW, and the trio hit the road together. Sean Waltman joined the group after Nash witnessed Waltman playing pranks on other members of the locker room backstage. Nash immediately knew that Waltman was the kind of guy 
that could hang with the click. The guys were fans of Triple H ever since they saw him wrestle on WCW Saturday night, and they became even bigger fans oh, yeah, when they trips. found out he didn't drink or do drugs so he could be the designated driver and a bag <laughs> carrier number one wow for the he could be forward. the designated men driver were all the friends Shawn Michaels <laughs> needed and it was even Damn. better because he was the clear leader of the pack the men had strength in numbers backstage and began leaning on Vince McMahon to influence booking decisions yep. in their favor backstage right politics. across the card McMahon had little choice but to acquiesce to their many demands Shane Douglas said, It wasn't just the guys on the bottom rung. I know that there was this very strong reaction amongst some of the bigger names in the dressing room that didn't like what was going on with the click. They saw it as a threat to their ability to make money, mm. to their ability to have talent to wrestle and oppose off of. Shane Douglas himself was affected by the click during his brief run with the company in 1995. Shawn Michaels and Douglas were supposed to wrestle for the Intercontinental Championship at In Your House 4, however Michaels had to vacate the title before the match due to a supposed injury. Douglas would receive the Intercontinental title via forfeit, however he would be embarrassed shortly thereafter when Scott Hall would force him to defend the title. Hall went on to defeat Douglas for the belt, making him the shortest ever wow. reigning Intercontinental Champion after just 20 minutes. Damn. It was one of the clearest indications of the click using their power backstage to get what they wanted. That's they cold. decided that Douglas wasn't good enough to compete in the Federation very early on, this humiliation on screen was the final nail in the coffin to months of backstage pressure and politicking to get rid of Douglas on behalf of the clique, and sure enough, it wouldn't be long before he was out the door and back in ECW. That's Douglas cold. would seethe on this treatment by the clique for years to come, even using the experience to feed back into his character in ECW. The real reason that Michaels had to forfeit the Intercontinental title to Douglas was due to him being nearly beaten unconscious during a bar fight in October 1995. Oh, On shit. television, an angle was concocted whereby Michaels had suffered a concussion. The clique had been momentarily split up due to half the roster going on a European tour and the other half staying in the US. Michaels and Waltman decided to hit the bar one night and Michaels started flirting with a girl on the dance floor. Sounds the girl turned right. out to be the girlfriend of a soldier who took offence to Michaels hitting on his woman. Of course. Things quickly escalated and Michaels ended up getting knocked out after getting <laughs> his head slammed in a car door. Damn! Triple H would later say, a million times where we'd been out places and Shaw would do the exact same thing, but I was there, Kev was there, Scott was there, you know, it's different. Mm -hmm. Nobody in the locker room at the time was surprised that Michaels ended up in this situation. Hotel next door neighbour, Sonny, didn't ask any questions as she escorted Michaels to the local emergency room. Sonny, whose real name was Tamara Sitch, was WWE's number one woman mm -hmm. in the mid-90s, now considered to be the Federation's first real diva. She debuted alongside real-life teenage sweetheart Chris Candido as fitness freaks The Body Donners in 1995. Sitch's act of kindness in taking Michaels to the hospital led to them getting closer and closer oh as she boy. would check on him every day. Michaels didn't care about the feelings of Sitch's actual <laughs> partner Chris Candido as the couple made their affair very Yo, well. I'm going to be honest with you, Shawn Michaels was was the original wrestling city boy, bro. Shawn Michaels was the first. I'm, I'm coining it now. I'm, I'm claiming this now. Shawn Michaels was the very first wrestler that was a city boy before city boys was a thing. That's exactly what Shawn Michaels was, bro. He didn't care if he had a chick. He didn't care, you know, <laughs> if he was married. And it didn't matter. If Shawn wanted you, he was going to shoot for you. You know what? Sean actually deserved this hoodie right here. I'm wearing. Uh, hold on. Let me let me, let me move the screen so y'all can see it. Let me move the mic. You see this hoodie? You see this hoodie? It's a toxic hoodie. He was the embodiment of toxic. He should have been wearing this for sure.
Let's get back to it, man. Obvious to everyone around them. They even went on vacation together, mm -mm. with Sitch showing off the photos of them both in Jamaica, right under Candido's nose. Wow. According to Sitch, she and Michaels would even have sex multiple times the Damn. night backstage at WWE shows, while Click members acted as a lookout. In the interim, wow. many wrestlers have stated how distraught Candido was during that time period, That's and cold. how Michaels didn't care what anyone else thought about the situation. In a later interview, That's Just cold. Incredible said, The Click didn't take any prisoners. They didn't hold anything back. I know Shawn Michaels was notorious, you know, and I love Shawn to death, but he was, and he'll tell you himself, he was a prick. Due to his attitude, Damn. Michaels was almost impossible to deal with face to face. Nobody could judge Michaels' mood on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. as his alcohol and drug consumption reached almost out of control levels. His life being ruled by uppers and downers, not even Vince McMahon himself, was safe. Vince Russo would later say, Sean disrespected everybody. I never saw anybody get in Vince's face more than Sean, not even close. I think Sean, to this day, is the only person I've seen, like, scream at Vince and get away with it. Yeah. Confirmed Kevin Nash. Michaels just did not care. He had he his knew, friends around him. He knew and he the was boss too talented to let go. Sean out of his ass. Nobody could doubt that he was the best wrestler on the roster, if not in the entire world. Well, that's apart from arch nemesis, mm -hmm. Bret right. Hart. Yeah. Brett comes into the picture and then is According like, to Hart, he almost things. became a member of the Click back in 1994 when WWE was on a tour of Germany. Hart was still on good terms with Michaels, Hall and Nash at the time and the men were drinking in the hotel bar. The men broached the idea of a wrestler's union to Hart whereby he would be the leader and would take the group's ideas to Vince McMahon. This was before Michaels had an established relationship of his own with the boss, and they mm. knew that Hart already had that relationship in place and therefore could influence McMahon's decisions. At the time, Hart declined the offer. He was well aware that all three men's social habits didn't align with his own, and mm -hmm. he personally felt that he would get no benefit from unionising with them. As far as Bret Hart was concerned in 1994, he was the golden child, yeah. and his push had already begun. Yeah. As the 90s wore on, animosity between the men would grow into complete hatred for one another. <laughs> in many ways, their career had run in parallel, yeah. both debuting as smaller guys, wrestling a more technical style in their respective tag teams in the 1980s. Hart was always slightly ahead of Michaels in his career, winning the WWE Championship first. The mm -hmm. WWE had long been known as the land of the giants, thanks to the likes of Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant in the 1980s, yet the decision to put the belt on Hart proved that Vince McMahon was willing to look at smaller, more athletic guys to main event the company going forward. Which was a big thing For Michaels, back then. this was a breakthrough. Ever since he arrived in the company, he'd been concerned that his height would hold him back, so he certainly knew he had the opportunity to be world champion himself going forward. At WrestleMania 11, Michaels faced his buddy Diesel for the world championship in the main event. Michaels went into the match as the heel challenger, but he actually emerged as a babyface mm. in a losing effort thanks to his crowd-pleasing antics. As far as Hart was concerned, Michaels had gone into business for himself and decided to turn himself face. Now, they were both on the exact same trajectory. Oh. They were both baby faces fighting for the same spot as number one in the company. Bret Hart would go on to defeat Diesel for the world title for a third time at the 1995 Survivor Series. Hart felt really unappreciated as the champion and he believed his reign to be transitional. He believed that they were just waiting for the right time to give Michaels the belt. And he was right. Mm. At WrestleMania 12, the two fan favourites clashed in an Ironman match which was won by Michaels. 
After the match, Michaels barked at Hart to get the fuck out of his ring while he celebrated. Wow. Hart later would say that he felt like yesterday's news to Vince McMahon and other members of management, and Michaels and the rest of the clique had directly influenced them. At the time, Michaels gloated to Hart that he was going to defend the belt against Scott Hall and Triple H and try and get one more main event between himself and Kevin Nash. In an interview, Michaels said... Mm. In my mind, I can certainly believe that I'd have the arrogance at that time to think that I could dictate who I was going to work with. And in my mind, I can even believe me at that time rationalising that I'm taking care of my buddies and working with my buddies and not thinking. In February 1997, Michaels vacated the championship. On a special Thursday night episode of Raw, Michaels told the viewing audience that he'd suffered a career-threatening knee injury, and more importantly, he'd lost his smile. Mm -hmm. In reality, Michaels has always insisted that he was both injured and at the peak of his drug addiction at the time, but others have always maintained that he didn't really want to drop the belt to Bret Hart directly, which is why the injury uh, storyline was put on the table instead. That makes Michaels sense. Michaels and Hart would continue to oppose each other in terms of mindset right up until Hart's last day in WWE. A comment in 1997 on an episode of Raw in which Michaels ironically insinuated that Hart had been having an affair with Sonny even resulted in a real backstage fight between yeah, the men. Enough has been written and videos have been made about the Montreal yes, screw job course, at the 1997 Survivor Series. However, Michaels denied all knowledge of the plan to screw Hart out of the title for years. It took a long time for the truth to finally come out about the events that occurred that night and Michaels was fully in on the job yeah Michaels would later say that he considered that night to be the lowest point of his entire career yeah Mark Calloway aka The Undertaker recognized the danger that the clique represented very early on he could see the many ways that the clique were causing damage to WWE. Locker room morale was at an all-time low in the early 90s as the clique squashed everyone they didn't approve of. That's the fear cold. of being picked on was monumental among the wrestlers in the locker room as the clique didn't just rib the other talents, they targeted them and ensured that their careers in WWE were short and totally miserable. Callaway saw that the Click were trying to monopolise the best spots on the card for themselves, and they were mostly succeeding. Callaway yeah. formed a group of his own known as the Bone Street Crew alongside Yoko Zuna, and they carefully selected other wrestlers to join them based off their similar mindset. While it has been later claimed that the group didn't ever come to blows with the Click, Callaway's boys did try and keep them in check. By the middle of 1996, however, there wouldn't be a click left to deal with. Mm -hmm. The curtain call was an incident that took place at a Madison Square Garden house show in April 1996. With Kevin Nash and Scott Hall leaving for WCW, it was the end of the click as they knew it. To the fans, the men in the ring were enemies. When they decided yeah. to hug each other in front of the fans at MSG, they were breaking kayfabe, yep. and Vince McMahon was totally no. furious. Shawn Michaels managed to avoid punishment for his actions considering he was one of WWE's biggest stars and got off the hook. <laughs> As Not Scott Triple Hall H. and Kevin Nash were out the door, all of the punishment fell to Triple H. Vader was an exciting prospect in 1996. The That's agile big man had proved his worth by providing thrilling contests in WCW and Japan, and he held multiple world championships on his way to the Federation. Vader seemed like the remedy to WWE's lacking main event scene, and surely his violent style would complement Michael's high-flying agility perfectly. A match at SummerSlam 1996 between Michaels and Vader for the title was the end goal, and the feud was set up at the Royal Rumble in January of that year. So far, so good. Only problem was, Michaels didn't like Vader and didn't want to work with him. 
one rumour suggests that Michael thought that Vader didn't wash his wrestling gear often enough and was unhygienic and thought that Vader worked too rough and believed that Vader would cause him an injury due to his in-ring style. So the writing was on the wall for Vader's main event push during the match at SummerSlam when Vader forgot to execute a planned spot coming off the top rope. Michaels angrily yelled at Vader during the match due to the discrepancy. After the match, Michaels complained to McMahon, as was so often the case at the time, and McMahon agreed. Vader would end up sliding down the card until he was finally released in 1998, and his true potential was never seen in WWE. Michaels' attitude towards his fellow wrestlers finally came to bite him in the ass for literally decades to come when he decided to pick on The Rock Uh during his formative years. The Rock's massive rise to prominence came after Michael's first retirement at WrestleMania 14 in 1998, but that didn't stop Michaels from having a go in 1997. Michaels had originally disrespected The Rock's grandmother during a show in Hawaii when he was a teenager, and The Rock never forgave him for that. Matters were made even worse when The Rock arrived in the company. Bret Hart claimed in his autobiography that both Michaels and Triple H despised The Rock when he debuted, despite being hampered by... A terrible gimmick, the young Rocky Maivia was obviously gifted in the ring and Mm -hmm. Michaels was getting scared, believing that he would take the place of his best friend at Triple H. And so Michaels tried to force Vince McMahon to get the Intercontinental title off Maivia, but the idea was nixed. The Rock has never truly forgiven Michaels for his behaviour, and so that dream match has never come to fruition. Mm. For sure, Michaels, there must have been a lot of soul-searching done between his retirement in 1998 and his return to the ring in 2002. By all accounts, he was a different man, apparently having found God and becoming clean from drink and drugs. The man will always be a legend in the wrestling business in the truest sense of the word. However, we shouldn't forget all of those he trampled over in order to get there. This was a good one, man. This was a good one, man. I love this. This was this was this was fantastic. I love this video. Make sure y'all go subscribe to the homie Stunned by Wrestling. Uh, I'm subscribed to him. I'm gonna link down the original video down below in the description so you guys can go check him out. This was very dope. Uh, I didn't want to pause it too much because I wanted to, you know, don't want to make this video too too long. But this was very enjoyable, very informative. And it's crazy how much pull Shawn Michaels had back then where he could tell Vince, I don't think he's he he got it in him, Vince. And then he just slides down the card until eventually he's let go. That's insane, bro. But I'm glad that he was able to overcome his demons and he's in a much better place. And, and this is a testament to anyone that feels like you can't change, bro. You can always be a better version of yourself if you allow that to happen you know surround yourself with good people good environments and you can change your ways people can be forgiven you know of course people are not going to forget what he's done but hopefully people can forgive what he's done and what he's doing now so comment down below let me know man what's your favorite we're, we're not going to focus on the negative what's your favorite Shawn michaels hbk match of all time let me know down below but i appreciate all the love and support you guys have shown on the channel road to 150k appreciate your kicking with me see you on the next one peace